around for the next Fjord Hammer book review. On today's show, I'm going to review The City of Secrets, one of the newest books from Games Workshop in the Age of Sigmar setting, and a book I think a lot of you have been waiting for. City of Secrets is written by Nick Hort, who is apparently a background writer for Games Workshop. Uh, written for 40k and for Age of Sigmar previously. As far as I can see, this is his first foray into the long form sort of book, and I have to say it's a pretty good job in that, so congrats, Mr. Hort. This book was released on the 14th of January, had a physical release on the 21st, so it coincides with the new Disciples of Zinch books, well, Battle Tome which makes a lot of sense. It's a good business strategy and it really ties well into that book. It's also the first book set after the Realmgate Wars themselves. Now there have been a lot of books set in the Realmgate Wars. There's been a couple of stories with elements before the Realmgate Wars, which was, as you guys remember, the sort of what the setting was between the start of Age of Sigmar when Vandis Hammerhand arrived on the scene and the Season of War summer campaign, which was apparently a period that lasted at least a decade, I'd say. But now we have our first intro into the setting after the Season of War. And uh, that's been roughly two generations since the founding of the city of this book. So that's pretty interesting. And that's re one of the reasons of why I wanted to review this book, other than it being new and very different, was that it, it is our first view into the new setting, into the new storyline, perhaps, into the new, the new direction of Age of Sigmar, really. It's also the first Age of Sigmar novel, which is written entirely from the perspective of a mortal human. There have been a couple of, there have been a lot of stories with parts from the human point of view, or stories with a lot of chaos, mortal points of view, but this is the first order human perspective, which I think a lot of you have been waiting for. If you've been asking yourself, oh, what are, what are the humans like in this setting? What, what's it like for the common man? This is the book to read. It's also, interestingly enough, the first appearance of the elves and the dwarden in the novels. Now, don't get too excited. These are elves and dwarden that were refugees from Azir and not native-born elves and dwarden. We've had native dwarden in the in the Legends of the Age of Sigmar Fire Slayer book, which is quite good. But this is our first meeting with the elves, specifically the Scourge Privateers. Our first meeting with the Scourge Privateers. Pretty interesting as well. There's a lot of new stuff in this book that we haven't seen in the older Age of Sigmar fiction. And that in itself makes this book both really interesting from a narrative perspective, but also a really important and almost almost a game changer in the meta perspective of, of how we finally get a look into the sort of normal lives, the lives that aren't belonging to the immortals of this setting. So what is this book about? It's a book, it's about Armon Callis, a sergeant in a free guild regiment who stumbles upon a murder mystery, or rather almost gets murdered and that's the mystery. In his uh, dramatic journey, he meets the witch hunter, Hanover Toll, who's got a Dwarden sidekick, and some mysterious force, judging by the cover, it's probably got something to do with Zeech, is plotting something evil. And this couple, Armin Callis and Hanover Toll, the witch hunter, have to uncover this plot and stop it before it threatens to ruin the city. So plot-wise, not a super unusual plot in that sense, but it certainly, it, it, it definitely works. And then, as I mentioned before, it's set now roughly two generations after the founding of the city of Excelsis, which is the setting of this book. So that means that it's at least two generations since uh, the season of war and the end of the Allgate books. A lot of time has passed, and that brings with it its own... Uh, interesting elements. As I mentioned on, in a previous book review, I wanted to focus on things like, does it capture the imagination? And, and this one does in a very different way. The older fiction has sort of focused a lot on the 
high fantasy elements of the setting. They've been they've been over the top. They've been super big. They've been very imaginative and very uh, very expressive in a sense. It's like they've been settings that you have to paint with bright colors and broad strokes. And this one is a blend. It's not a low fantasy book. It blends a lot of those low fantasy elements that a lot of you might have been missing. Uh, it's set in a city and it's not a bright, nice, shiny beacon of hope. It's a lived in city with real problems that we can all relate to, like being poor, having miserable weather, cities are covered in crap, drug addictions of all sorts, you know, the sort of what you'd expect from a semi-large medieval city. And how it does this is that it blends the high fantasy elements that are so integral to Age of Sigmar into these more realistic, in lack of a better word, elements. Like, the city of Excelsis is founded around a shard of the world that was that fell into the realm of beasts. By mining this shard, people can get small, like, small stones that if you break them, you can get a small prophecy. You might know if you're going to get a raise or what hand you should bet money on in poker or stuff like that. Or if you break a lot of them, you might get prophecies of where there's hidden treasure or there's armies coming to invade the city and stuff like that. Uh, so it's a very high fantasy sort of thing, but it's also turned into something completely normal in that this is currency. People pay for this stuff and people get paid in it. And there's illegal trade and you can overdose in these prophecies and just get your mind stuck in a continual loop to get new prophecies and that poor and desperate people try to get a hold of, of them just so that they have a chance of getting out of their uh, current life situation so that's sort of one way that they blend the high and the low fantasy here uh, there's also like various addictions that are very high fantasy in their concept but have very low fantasy consequences in that you find what is essentially a drunk, a dead drunk in a back alley, just that his addiction isn't alcohol, it's some sort of magical thing. So it's quite vivid in its blend of these high fantasy and believable real world applications. And I really like that. One of the other really interesting parts here is that there are stormcasts in this book, but you don't get their perspective. We get the mortal perspective on the Stormcast, and it's pretty terrifying. Now, we're used to the Stormcast. If you've read any of the fiction, you know the Stormcast. You know, you're friendly with them. You understand their perspective and the necessity of a lot of things that they do. But in this book, you get the humans who obviously haven't read any of this and how they're terrified of the Stormcast, so they don't understand them, and they don't trust them in the same way that they trust each other. Because obviously to the Stormcast, humans are potentially unpure. They might be corrupted by chaos, and if anything is corrupted, then it has to go. And that's part of the setting and the background of this story, in that uh, after the founding of the city, the Lord Veritant of the Knights Excelsior, now called the White Reaper, uh, went through the city with fire and iron to cleanse it of all the unbelievers and all the chaos tainted and uh, essentially murdered like a quarter of the population of the city, which has left its mark. Getting that, int that, that view is very, very interesting. And this city is well realized and it does capture my imagination and it holds it all the way through. Now, we can't talk about a book like this without getting on to the characters, because this, is, this isn't this is the sort of book where you're swept away by the, uh, by the imagery, because it's more subtle than it, we're used to. So instead, it's the character work that has to hold the book up and make it work. And it does, by and large. Our main character, Armand, Armand Callis, is uh, a bit tropey. He's a bit typical of what you'd expect. He's a career soldier. He's straight-laced, but also slightly jaded. Uh, he does his duty because it's his duty, and he believes in that sort of thing. But he doesn't necessarily like his, uh, his place in life. He's not boring, but he's also a bit flat in that sense. Uh, he's pretty much what you would expect of him. Hannah Toll is pretty much exactly what you would expect of him. He's a witch hunter. 
he's cool and he's tough and he's got this rough exterior that of being in complete control of everything but obviously on the inside he doesn't know what he's doing and he cares a lot for his companions and he's got a real soft spot for them now this doesn't necessarily have to be a po bad thing that these characters aren't very unique but i feel in a lot of cases they lack the inherent and interesting tension of series like Gotrek and Felix, where Gotrek's own character is in fact quite interesting and quite different and creates a lot of tension just by who, who he is in a way that a career soldier or a witch hunter doesn't necessarily have. And Felix's relationship with Gotrek is also a source of potential dramatic tension, whereas Hanover and Armand's isn't in the same way because they sort of work together out of necessity and neither of them show any inclination to fall into Zinch, so we know that they're probably going to cooperate on things. So the characters aren't the most interesting, but they're well written, they're a joy to read, so I'm not holding this against the book. They're, they're, the characters definitely keep the book running and keep it entertaining. It definitely works, I'd just like to see more sides to the characters and more flavor to them other than what I had expected after the first few pages. Mr. Horth does a good job on the banter and the talk and the writing of these characters so it's quite enjoyable to read them and they have a lot of good lines. I had a lot of fun reading this book. Quite quickly paced as in it gets to the point quite quickly. The characters are well written. You're not sitting there bored or going Oh, now we have a scene with him. Can I just skip this? No, you're going to read every page and it's going to entertain you the entire way. Because of how Horth has written them, it, it just worked. For fans of the series and fans of uh, older editions of Warhammer, there's a lot of small like bits of pieces of info and references and stuff like that. So you'll be constantly reading this and going, Oh, I remember that. Or, oh... That's different from how I remember that. So th this book is enriched by your previous experience, but you don't need to know anything else about the Age of Sigmar to read and understand and enjoy this book. It's just like a bunch of Easter eggs, really. My sort of main complaint is that it's quite quickly paced, and it's not very long, and I feel that it could have spent some more time dealing with the sort of mystery investigation and that sort. The book spends a lot of time sort of running and setting up the characters and making them meet. And then it's sort of a beeline to the end. As entertaining as that was, I felt that there could have been moments where he could have let the city shine a bit more. And let the city grow on the reader. In the first quarter of the book, there's a lot of good parts about that. And the city sort of gets its own character. And then once the, the sort of the mystery is up or the as sort of as we get a hint of what the mystery and what the the plot going on on here is things go very very quickly and maybe the book would have benefited from taking a bit more time with that establishing some threads and exploring the city and basically making the witch hunter do his witch hunter job and hunting things instead of uh, being hunted but that's a fairly personal complaint uh, in the sense that that's the sort of book I would have preferred to read, but it's not it's not a huge like detriment to the book. If you would prefer quicker reads that just sort of get to all the cool stuff really quickly, this book does that. So as I've mentioned, this book fits into the into the age of Sumar in two very important ways. One that it expands the setting because it's the first book in the post Realmgate Wars setting. It's our first meeting with the realms after some of the realm gates have been closed and after Sigmar's essentially won the realm gate wars and established the new cities and started to repopulate the realms with his refugees from the Zir. So it doesn't have anything to do directly with any of the other storylines. One story arc is completed. This is now a part of a new story arc. And the other... The other thing that it makes it uh, interesting is, of course, the perspective. Perspective on the story from humans, from Dwarden, and from elves. Ultimately, though, I don't think this is a book that brings any sort of pivot points to the table. It hasn't talked about any major future plot lines beyond the sort of corruption of Zinch of the mortal cities. It's unlikely to be more than just sort of mentioned now and again. 
in in other narratives. We probably will see this setting again. The Excels is a great city. I don't feel like it's a book where the plot of the main series will revolve. Of course, it's sort of the point of these Legends of the Age of Sigmar books. They're really just a way for, for Games Workshop and for the Black Library to expand on the setting without having to deal with the ongoing plot and narrative of the series as a whole. So really, you don't need to know a lot of the plot of the Age of Sigmar, you just need to know the basic concepts and what the Stormcast Eternals are and that sort of stuff, and it fits really well in. Now I had some feedback after my uh, previous review of, you know, how can the books that we read tie into our hobby? How can they tie into our games? How can they tie into the models that we make and the way we paint them and the short stories we write for our own stuff and that sort of thing? And I think this book is a wealth of riches for people. Uh, it obviously pr it provides a lot of context for your Disciples of Sinch book. If you're looking to get on the Zine Change train, this book provides you with a setting of, oh, this is how their forces work. This is how the characters and the, the, the acolytes and all that sort of spring to life when, they, when their plot unfolds. So that's probably a lot of rich ground for inspiration, if nothing else. Obviously, terrain uh, is something that this provides. We haven't had a lot of like actual city terrain in the Age of Sigmar. It's mostly been like ruins and, well, ruins and wastelands, and maybe the occasional forest. But here you have a fully fledged city with a poor quarter and a merchant's quarter and a wealthy place and all these sort of high fantasy buildings. If you've been thinking that you want to build cities and build a uh, human habitat, but feeling a bit uh, let down by what uh, Games Workshop has to offer at the moment, let this city be your inspiration. You know, read this book, you know, grab your tools and start building something. Because there's a lot of stuff here that can do really well on the table and become a really cool project. And I would love to see that. And if you want like tips and inspiration, definitely check out the work that the Warhammer World team has done. Uh, they've combined a lot of like the plastic kits with other stuff in order to create really unique and really Age of Sigmar-esque terrain. And if you got the talent and the the will, really just the will, that's the most important part, you could definitely make that sort of terrain yourself and make that into a living, breathing city with that has mortals in it. The walls that you're defending aren't ruined walls. They're the walls of a city with a desperate population behind them and the hordes of chaos in front of them. There's a lot of inspiration to draw there. For all of you free guild and uh, elven players, there's a lot of inspiration here. Uh, there are a lot of city guard regiments of different sorts of free guild in this book. But you could like copy their iconography if you like it. The Free Guilds even got some Ironweld Arsenal backup. So there's a Free Guild with a steam tank and with rocket artillery and cannons. It would make a recognizable army from older editions, but it now definitely has a place in the Age of Sigmar. You could paint your army and say, this is the city guard from Excelsis. It's in a book. It exists. It's not just a repainted empire model. It is actually Age of Sigmar. Sort of the same with the elves. The elves that show up here are the uh, Scourge Privateer kind, which is like the piratey sort, and they take up a sort of mafia role here. Uh, they own the docks, and everything that comes through the docks has to pay a fee to them and that sort of stuff, unofficially, of course. It provides some rich like tapestry for how you can reimagine your Scourge Privateers. You know, they don't necessarily have to be slavers, and murderers and that sort of stuff, they can just be pirates, or mafia, or, you know, guys in the grey area of the law instead of straight in the black. You know, if you want to make like a small thousand point army of Scourge privateers, you could say, oh, these are the elves from Excelsis. You'd have great reason to have a city basing on your Scourge privateers. Like imagining that the city's being sacked and they're defending their docks, uh, trying to evacuate people or something. I think just having given us a new setting with that breathes and has people of all sorts in it has just given given people and given us 
a new place, a new inspiration to draw from in how we create our armies. And I think that's great. I think that's a very good thing. And obviously we can't forget witch hunters, now called the Order of Azir, like in technical terms. So I'm wondering if that's going to change in a future book. It's like there have been a lot of cool Inquisition models for 40k lately. You could definitely take something like that and convert it into Age of Sigmar and have a witch hunter running or running around alongside your free guild regiments. That would be really cool. So there's just a lot of potential here. We finally have uh, mortal cities, like in the old world where there was like Altdorf and Middenheim and, and Marienburg that people would base their armies around. Now you have that, but in the Age of Sigmar. And I think that's a very good thing. So would I recommend this book? Definitely. This is a book that you will want to read. It's great for anyone who's been missing the uh, low fantasy sort of appeal of settings that hasn't been quite obvious in the Age of Sigmar up until now. It's great for anyone who wants the human or the, the regular people perspective, whether it's humans or elves or dwarden. It's not the greatest thriller mystery plot in the world. It's not going to shock you or surprise you greatly, but it's definitely workable. It's definitely entertaining. And it really enhances the setting as a whole just by moving into this new arc of the Age of Sigmar plot and narrative and giving us a new hook into the setting that we didn't have before. The hook that I think can sink quite deeply into a lot of people. Probably not going to be a must read in the meta narrative sense. You're probably not going to lose any major plot threads by not reading this. But if you just want a, a fun, entertaining read in a new setting with new perspectives that you might have been missing for the last year and a half, definitely read this book. And that's everything for this mini episode of Fjordhammer. If you'd like to contact me, you can send me an email at fjordhammerpodcast at gmail.com. You can contact the podcast directly on Twitter at Fjordhammer. You can contact me at Darth underscore Alec. Or you can find me on tj.community and the reddit.com slash r slash age of Sigmar under the name of Darth Alec. Join me again next week when the next minisode comes out. Adios.